Now we're going to move back to our, after completing our space frame module, we're going to move back to the interior of the building we've been working on and really start to build out um, all kinds of interior components. So this is a, a great chance for, and probably the strongest chance we'll have in this course to really look at what we do with interior design. We'll spend a lot of time on this, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a head start. We won't have an in-class uh, module this week um, to uh, allow you to get started on this. And we're going to build all kinds of fun components. Um, here's a little view from the outside of our building just to give you a little context. Um, and I think this is really this is really nice. This, I believe this is probably a, um, this is probably realistically rendered. I'm not seeing the kind of gloss levels in our floor. Um, and I, d I had done this a few years back. Actually, this probably is realistically now because I'm seeing this glass reflection of the skies. But I thought this was really a nice view to kind of told you what we're building. Um, kind of looking in from a elevated point from a drone perspective of what our second floor mezzanine area will be when we start to build out components. And um, interior work is a, a big part of what we do as architects. Um, and I have, a, I guess, a few examples. Um, Gensler, which is a, a, a huge architectural, global architectural firm, um, is actually one of those that really concentrates on the ability to execute very well on interior architecture. And I've had some kind of um, relationships with them in the idea that they would um, approach us when I was consulting at Rigidized Metals uh, to discuss the uh, complexities of the interior arrangements of spaces. And I use this example because I think what's going on in the interior building is every bit as complex and involved as, if not more, than what happens on the exterior buildings. So this was for the uh, Los Angeles um, uh, football club. And football, I mean... Um, the soccer club that was um, looking at expanding into um, the, the uh, LA marketplace. And they were trying to create these really kind of exciting, um, uh, high value spaces for people who were buying box seats and things like that. And they approached us just as an example, just with the detailing of this one wall that they'd come up with. And, you know, the relationships of um, what happens as an architect, uh, you design this kind of a shape, um, you come up with ideas the way you want to light it. I think lighting is a really important um, a nuance of what we're, where we're going when we start to look at interiors. So I kind of want to, I want you to start thinking about lighting. Um, but, you know, as they approached us, um, you as the architect would be asking us, okay, I have this idea. Now, how are we going to actually get it constructed? And you'd be working with vendors like us to help describe the ideas of how we would maybe panelize the surfaces, how we would introduce the kind of light that they would want to, um, you know, the kind of lighting effects that they would be interested in, um, how it might be mounted or hung. And in this case, it was specifically towards the techniques that we had as um, what we could manufacture for them. Um, so uh, a, a lot of details on the interior and a lot of time spent as architects with these kind of relationships between the client, uh, the ideas you have, and the vendors, the people, the contractors that are actually going to produce the components that you have um, designed and promoted to your client. And with that idea of light um, and, and introduction of light, um, interiors are, are one of the places where um, we have a lot of control over lighting. Um, on the exterior buildings, we have one light source, the sun, um, and um, you know our only variation is time of year and time of day. But when we move to the inside of buildings, um, we have a lot of control over how we light surfaces. And one way to think about the power or the strength or excitement of what happens when we light interior surfaces is that we can start to re reveal things about shape and form um, that we don't, we can't do in the kind of nuanced way that we can do in the interior of a building. So you can also think of wall surfaces as being um, um, just a play of light. Um, the idea of um, imagining we're manipulating spaces um, not to create form, but to create a play of light in the surfaces to reveal form. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to punch that up so that you think about this idea of lighting going forward. There's a couple of, I guess, technical things about lighting um, to keep in mind. Um, I'll probably discuss a little bit about this um, later on in the course. Actually, it probably won't happen here, but when we get to environmental controls, this will be one of the places where we talk about the quality of color of light. Um, so this, um, uh, when, when we're working between the outside and the inside of buildings, we have um, natural lighting, sunlight, which is a very high color temperature, very bright white um, 
kind of lighting. And when we move to the interior of the buildings, many times we try to warm that light up and our fixtures don't actually create that kind of clear blue white light. As a matter of fact, it's considered many times objectionable on the lighting of interiors. So here we have a comparison of what, you know, this is just a really stark comparison of how blue light looks when compared to warm inside lighting. A lot of this idea about lighting is changing over uh, because our lighting instruments are going from incandescent um, heated filaments to LED bulbs. And, you know, predominantly most of the lighting that we're using on the interiors now is LED lighting. And there's some nice advantages to that, the purity of the light. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this other than because it's really in, um, just an introduction um, to the fact that we're going to be placing these lighting instruments. But I do want you to be aware that you have this idea of color control and that the advantages of it uh, can be important. So this is an experiment I did with, um, this is right side inside of Revit. I put a decal on the wall and then changed the color value of three lighting fixtures. And the reason why you want to want to be aware of this is if you kind of look, and I'll back up to this one too, this idea of creating a warm color, um, look at the um, look at the lack of color contrast in things like this Tiffany lampshade here. Um, so when we get to these um, more um, daylight type lighting systems, we get uh, revealing much more of the color values that are in the room. Things start to pop and look lively. When we have an altered or warmed color space, our colors become more muted and um, subtle with each other. And that could be a desired effect. Um, we just need to know, you need to know as a designer what the implications of it are. So in this case, I played with three different lighting, um, lighting um, color rendering indexes or color temperatures from a warm color to a really bright one. And I think probably the focus here is this idea of a warm color. If you'll notice the, um, even in the, in the way this light is working in an artificial world, how the colors are now kind of um, muted together. And when I brighten up that color temperature to a whiter light, um, you see a separation in color. And you could be trying to get to this kind of an idea of muted colors within your space. Um, but the converse is, is that you might be trying to pop up your colors and be using warm color temperatures, and that's giving you a problem. So, um, uh, the quick um, the quick thing inside of Revit is the color control that you have. So here I've um, placed these down lights. And if you look into this pop-up of the editing of the properties of that, um, you'll notice that I have um, initial color temperature that I can, um, can change. I can change the amount of wattage of any single fixture. And over here we have... Uh, if I've selected that, I have the idea of what the color temperature would look like. And you can see in this case, it's a really warm yellow. And it gives you kind of an image of what those coloring renderings are. Um, really more than you you um, need to know for this this module. But um, this might be the, the only time um, that I'm, I can make you aware um, formally within the program of our education that you have control over the colors of these instruments, these lighting instruments that you place on the interior building. I've talked about this a little bit before and the idea of bespoke components, custom componentry. It's, um, I think it's really a European or more British com um, um, term bespoke. Um, but it, it, it is the idea of custom. We're going to spend a lot of time in this lab making custom componentry. And um, I'm doing it to empower you going forward. Um, and this here's an example of um, a project that I had recently um, was asked to do. It was to help redesign the, um, the materials lab for one of our, um, our departments in the uh, SCT building. And um, this is an interior shot. This is all done inside of our Revit modeler. Um, but I used a lot of the techniques that you're going to learn in the project we're doing. Um, in this case, I put monitors up on the walls. I made custom shelving. You'll notice, um, I'll, I'll show you a little more details in some of the other ones. But many of the components inside here were custom created. Like the, um, these are uh, power cords that hang down from the wall. These were cut, I had to custom make these. I couldn't find a model of these. Um, most of the, the things that are sitting on the shelves here are all custom made. Um, things that aren't custom made, um, I believe the computer monitor I brought in as a unit, I brought in the chairs, but I had to custom make the um, little weighing scales here. And here's another view, and, uh, and this is where I make the connection between our, our making bespoke components, custom components, and the utilities going forward of the techniques we use. 
So I had remembered that in the awning system I created, we took steel and cut out made cutouts of it. And I thought that would be a nice technique to use for kind of this fabrication of these custom shelves. So I knew how to do this technique and I was able to transfer it to something that was completely different. Um, and in our lab, um, we're actually going to go down to that kind of level of detail where we're going to actually make our own custom monitors that sit on the table, mostly so we can have control over things. Like, for instance, if we were to drag on a monitor that was from a, um, let's say, a, um, a family element that we grabbed in, it might be a black, for instance. And maybe we wanted to have a white style back plastic constructed monitor to sit on our tables to look better. You know, we wanted it to match our furniture system, and we thought it was really important. So the idea of being bespoke in the construction of these elements, in, and you'll notice how really simple they're going to be to construct. But I want you to be familiar with the techniques and really comfortable to be able to use them. One of the things we're going to do also is we're going to make a little custom office area. And I'm really trying to get us moved from just using walls kind of putting doors in solid surfaces. So we're going to make a transparent kind of office divider. Um, but these are the things that really help to enliven interior surface or interior um, spaces. The idea of custom uh, or semi-custom componentry um, that creates a sense of playfulness and openness within the space. And I um, want you to be immediately comfortable to be able to say, I saw something in a catalog that looked cool and I want to include it, but I don't have a model of it and I'll just quickly produce one. We'll also produce a custom counter uh, surface to work on. I think this is um, really important on interior arrangements because if you're working with standard size countertops, many times they just won't work for you. And it's really common to make custom counter surfaces, um, maybe to um, have multiple people working at them. Later on, you can substitute them for off-the-shelf products. Um, but um, many times it's better to start with what you absolutely need and then to back source um, and make decisions on whether you can find something in the marketplace and or um, still want to go forward with actually custom constructing it. And the same thing with these, you know, a few specific custom elements. Um, in this case, I don't make an entry, um, um, uh, you know, desk. That is, you can see this as being the front counter when you get to a, um, a medical building and check in or do something like that. But once again, I want you to have the idea of being able to create these uh, bespoke components. And in this case, um, you know, and, and this is kind of my evolution here. In previous years, I made this as a solid surface on the floor and then put a round countertop on it. In later years, I thought, well, this looked a little bit clunky. You couldn't see. Um, it created a sense of, um, uh, no, you know, lack of transparency. And so I said, well, what would happen if we were to open this up and create just a regular kind of countertop for this area? And once again, really easy to do because we're working in custom componentry. The overall buildup of our space, um, this is um, very similar to the project that we're doing. Um, this is a, a co-working space with a, um, a mezzanine area. You'll notice a kind of custom, a little bit of custom nature of the railing systems, but not unlike what we're doing here. Um, just want to get you a feeling for the real world arrangement and, and layout of interior spaces. I want to touch on this idea of what happens up in the ceiling plane here. In this case, there's very little going on, and that's really not necessarily problematic. But many times in interior spaces, we start to create visual interest with what's going on in the ceiling. Um, and so we're going to experiment a little bit with that idea of creating these ceiling clouds. On the uh, right-hand side, or excuse me, yeah, on the right-hand side here for you, um, we have um, a medical building in the, in the western New York area that I visit. And I think this is kind of maybe an overdone idea of ceiling clouds. But these um, ceiling clouds provide a lot of opportunity for hosting lighting fixtures, um, sound systems, disguising the uh, ductwork and the heating and ventilation systems that go above. And they also provide acoustic control. They are a place to absorb sound within the spaces. So we're going to experiment a little bit with creating those kind of custom ceiling systems in order to help us define uh, the spaces that we um, want to define without using actual walls. And this happens all the time. Here's a company. It's called Radius Track. They make custom metal framing. Um, so the, the bespoke um, custom surfaces that we make are first framed in 
um, metal framing, just like two by four framing of a wall. And then drywall um, and uh, plasterboard is uh, gypsum wallboard, uh, if probably the best way to refer to it, is applied to the surfaces to create these kind of monolithic shapes. And there's all kinds of flexibility with these kind of track systems to create these kind of curved uh, two-dimensional pieces of geometry. I'm just showing you some examples of those just to show you that that's really done. We build these cloud systems um, all the time. This one looks like it might be um, the shape of a guitar, um, probably over the bar at like a hard rock cafe or something like that. And then I wanted to finish this up, just uh, just a couple more slides. This is an um, this is the offices of Airbnb. Um, they caught my attention because I thought they had that industrial look, um, kind of similar to what's going on in the inside of our building. Um, and you can see uh, just clever uses of railings for um, with a little bump out of a table for a gathering space. Um, once again, this idea of bespoke componentry. Obviously, this is probably custom made specifically to sit in this location, this work table that we're looking at here. Um, and so I could easily see that once we once you develop the techniques for making our, our work tables in our lab, um, you'll be able to uh, quickly make these kind of bespoke um, surfaces for yourself. And pay attention. We have a great a bunch of examples on campus of what's happening with interior design um, through the renovations of our residence halls. And there's a lot of nice um, ideas about materiality, um, ceiling systems, railing systems, uh, things going on, um, uh, ideas that you should place in your mind to carry forward. Um, you know, once again, here we have that um, example of this idea of ceiling clouds, multi-layers to create visual interest in space. Um, you know, all of these should feed into, um, I guess, a little mental notes, um, clipboards uh, for you to think about um, going forward with your interior designs. And hopefully while you're working through the project and making the ceiling clouds, you'll see the relevance of doing these kind of bespoke components.